Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. How big? What does that include? Are you sure? I'm not sure you sure. Because if you were sure, you wouldn't be hating the Muslims or the Buddhist or the Scientologist or the Hindu or them folks with a different color skin or those dirty people on the side of the street or the prostitute you saw on your town street the other night you, the drug addict who's wandering around aimless you, are you sure you know whosoever is? maybe whosoever is uh, those nice clean people who comes into your path and, and they don't offend you much and that's who you believe God loves I love whosoever. Whosoever believeth on him. This verse also tells us what the objective of sending Jesus is. God's objective for sending Jesus to the world is so that the world could believe in Jesus. God wants the world to believe him and that's a tough assignment for someone to believe they need evidence they also need to have created in them a desire and they also need to, to create in themselves or you create in them a sense of benefit. In other words, I believe in this thing because it's going to do something for me. Belief is a very complicated thing. To believe someone, you must have empirical evidence. You must provide information. The ultimate goal of God is so that all of them could have eternal life. What a verse of scripture. Everything's in it. Now, so God so loved the world, he sent his son. His son comes into the world because God sent him to the world. The son comes to the world, but he doesn't stay in the world. Because he comes to love or to show God's love for the world. To show God's love for the world, he de devised a program to do that. And the program was to create a group of people who would do that for God. Let me try it this way. God loved the world so much that he sent his son to create a mechanism so the world could be loved or feel the love or know the love and believe the love. <laughs> it's not Jesus who loves the world. Jesus is the evidence that God sent to the world so the world could know that he loves it. The evidence came to create evidence so that the world could know that God loves it. What did this son create? so the world could know that God loves it. <laughs> he created a group of people out of the world so that the world could know that God loves it. 
and he called this group of people church as a matter of fact uh, they're not called church uh, called out group means church Are you following me? So what God actually did was he sent his son, his son sent the church. I want you to get this now. Therefore, the purpose for the church is to prove to the world that God loves it and to love the world for God. We ain't doing too well. I'm going to say it again. The purpose for the church is to love the world for God and to prove to the world that God loves it. Now, what we have done, this thing called church, we believe that our purpose is to go to heaven, to leave earth, to abandon the world, to hate sinners, to avoid the world, to don't mix with the world, to despise the world, to condemn the world, to rebuke the world, to treat the world as less than important, to, to not associate with the world. We, I mean, we do the complete opposite to everything God wants us to do with the world. We actually hate the world that God loves. Do you know that, that we are showing the world the opposite of what God wants to show the world? God wants to show the world what? His love. What's the church doing? We love in ourselves. A church service is a self-pity party pretending to have a good time. We spend more time complaining in church services about what God ain't doing for us than we do doing what God told us to do. So we need to regroup and stop what we're doing, back up a little bit, and see if we can get our mandate back. The mandate is what? Go ye into all the world. Now, watch this. God loves the world, so he what? He gave, he sent his only son. His son so loved the world, he did what? He sent his only church. Do you see that? God sent the son, the son sent the church. God sent the son to the world, the, the son sent the world to the church. I mean the church to the world. So, so the church is supposed to be God's evidence that he loves the world. Well, look at John chapter 3 verse 17. The other verse. Why does Jesus, after he tells us how much God loves the world, in verse 16, he rushes to tell us what we shouldn't do to the world. Let's read it. For God sent his son not into the world to condemn the world. Now that's exactly what the church is doing. I mean, he quickly puts in this important correction or caution. What a God. For God sent his son not into the world to condemn the world. Why? Because God loves the world. How can you condemn something you love? You are either schizophrenic, insane, or crazy. I love you, that's why I hate you. I mean, that's how, it, that's how we work it. I 
I love you, but you ain't good for nothing. I love you, but you ain't worth it. Are you confused? For God sent his son not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, the world through him might be saved. And then he comes and he creates this body called the church and he becomes the head of it. So that the world through him, who's him? This body with this head. Christ is called the head of the church, which is his body. So that the world through him might be saved. That means the world is supposed to be saved, not through really the head, but through the body. The church. That's why the head left. Hallelujah. So how are you doing in your workplace? How come people don't like you? How come when you show up, people run? So, oh boy, here comes those crazy Christians again. Let's go. Oh, here he comes again, all this Jesus stuff. Uh, let's leave. That's exactly what they say about you at work. Your family scatters when you go to visit. Come on, talk to me. Something's wrong here. Tell me, how come they don't like you and they loved Jesus? Are you supposed to be loving them for him? Do you know, it's amazing, for God so loved the world, he sent who? His only begotten son. And what does his son do? Makes the world love him. How do he do that? By showing the world he loved them. I mean, the prostitutes love this guy. The children love this guy. The rich love this guy. The poor love this guy. Females love this guy. Males love this guy. Wine bibbers love this guy. Tax collectors love this guy. Roman soldiers love this guy. Everybody loved him. Why do they hate you? You ain't doing something right. You don't know how to love the world. As a matter of fact, religion, Christian religion, has taught you that the world should be hated. That's why God hasn't come back yet. We don't love the world, be honest. What did they teach you in Sunday school, in church, in Bible study? What did they teach you? Handle not, touch not, taste not, come out from among them, be separated, be peculiar, which really means superior. I mean, I remember when you used to be my friend. What happened since you were a Christian? You used to come down and visit me all the time. What happened? Am I scornful now? Wow. We don't know how to love the world. The 21st century church must change. Let me make a few statements about the church. Number one, the church does not exist for heaven. <laughs> Number two, God does not want the church in heaven. Prove, prove, prove me wrong. Read your Bible and, and prove me wrong. Tell me if I'm wrong. I dare you to tell me if I'm wrong. Find a scripture and tell me I'm wrong. If God wanted you in heaven, he would have killed you a long time ago. Quickest way to get there. Number three, the church exists for the world. Number four, the church exists for the nation. Hmm. 
Number five. The church is assigned to the nation. Go ye into all the world and make disciples of the nation. That is the assignment. So the church belongs to the nation. But we hate the nation. We despise the nation. We, we condemn the nation. We wish the nation would just go to hell. Literally. Why? After all, we're straight. We're saved. Our kids are saved. Our husbands saved. Wives saved. Dogs saved. Our cats even anointed. We, we're just ready to go to heaven. We, God forbid. The assignment of the church is to reconcile the world back to God. Jesus said, Matthew 28, verse 18, Go ye into all the world and make disciples of what? All nations, and then baptize them into the authority of God, which means name. Give them back the authority of God. Write this statement down, please. This is the most profound statement that you could ever be given. Here's a statement. Sinners are not God's enemy. Wow. Everybody was born a sinner. Write this down. Second profound statement. Every sinner is God's son. I know you don't believe that. By your, by your behavior, of course. You don't believe that. Every sinner is God's son. <coughs> I wish God would brainwash you with that. Or wash your brains with that. Every sinner is God's son. Say it with me. Every sinner is God's son and my brother. So God tells you to go get your brother. You're in the house. You got the robe on. You got your shoe on. You got your ring on. And you eat all the beef and the, and, the, and, and the lamb chops you want. Now get out of here. Go get your brother at the pig pen. And you treat your brother like an enemy. Do you know why Jesus was so uptight about the Pharisees and scribes? Do you really know, do you, do you really understand his, his anger? His anger was related to really a simple issue. And that was the Jew, the sons of Abraham, were chosen to be the elder sons to go and get their brothers, the Gentiles. <laughs> but the elder brother turns out calling his other brother the enemy. They even use words like dog, heathen. So when the son came, he went to the elder brother first. Come on, y'all think with me. And he tells, I came first to my own. I must go to the elder brother first. Why? Because that's his job to go get them. So he had to go to the Israelites first. And he spent three and a half years, yay, even 30, 30 years. And then 33 and a half years, he lived with them and he tried to convince them that that's your brother. When the father's son arrived, he met the older brother, cursing the younger brother, hating the younger brother, not 
mixing with the younger brother, calling the younger brother dog, and considering himself more important than the younger brother, and superior to the younger brother, and didn't care about the younger brother, and was praying for the death of the younger brother. That's the condition he met the older brother in. Sounds like the church. I mean, don't you just wish all Muslims would die? Yes, you do. I mean, you ain't going to admit that, but deep inside, way down there where God knows, you wish these Hindu temples would just explode. Every Hindu person would just drop dead and go to hell so we could have a Christian community. See your attitude. That Hindu is your Lord's brother. That's why he's a Hindu. What do you expect? He's lost. Attitude. So he came to the elder brother. And he told the elder brother, first of all, what his job was. Go get your old younger brother. The older brother says, that's not my brother. That's a heathen. It's a pagan. And then Jesus said, okay, woe unto you. Because your younger brother is going to the banquet first. Come on, read the parables. He said, the, the, since you don't want to go get your younger brother, I'm going to go get him myself. Now, you know that's a terrible the father is going to get the brother of the pig pen. Why? Because the older brother is at home and he's jealous and angry at the younger brother. And when the younger brother does come home, he's mad. You know, there are people who don't want their church to grow. Too many people in here. We need a, I, I used to be able to go to pastor and shake his hand. Now there are too many people in here. Many people came from. We had such a nice church until these people, these people came. Older brother. This church is so cold now. We're not warm anymore. We, were, we used to be so intimate. And now there's so many people. Uh, we, we, we don't see one another that we used to. We don't fellowship you. You make the father sick. You think this is only for you, huh? Listen to one of his parables. He said, uh, a man had a banquet and invited his sons, and they did not come. So he sent his servants to find anybody from the highways and the byways and, and the hedges. He said, bring them in. I'm going to fill my banquet. If the, if, if, the, if the sons don't want to come, I'm going to get some folks. That's how the Gentiles became the church. Now he created this thing called church. Because he wept over the older brother. Remember, he wept. He says, oh, I wanted to use you to go get your brother, but you just ain't got the attitude. So, lo, I go to the Gentiles. Let me get the family from the younger brother. How many of you glad he got us? Amen. I said, how many of you glad we got, we got included, right? Amen. Amen. And guess what? Now he called you out. And guess what he's doing? He's sending you also into the world. Well, same instructions he says to you. Now you go not into heaven. Don't concentrate on heaven. I don't want no books on the rapture. I don't want you to be calling me out of heaven, telling me to come. Go do your work. Go into all the world. Two thousand years later, we still tell him to come. We wish our 
younger brother would go to hell. Do you know the most powerful force on earth is love? I mean, you could, you could, you, <laughs> you could break a guy, and no matter how big he is, no matter how demon possessed the fella is, no matter how, er, how much an error, whether it is Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Shintoism, Taoism, Spiritism, Communism, it doesn't matter. Forget that all that is just a sign of ignorance. But if you love that person, if they know you love them, you got them. Do you know what you want to do? You don't love them. You're trying to convince them. You're too busy trying to convert them to the way you think. You ain't got time to love them. Get a little technical here. You know, let me tell you this way. Most of us do not like the people we are witnessing to. And, they're with, and those people know it. Oh, I tell you, I got something going on in me. In the 21st century, I want God to take all the tracks from the church. Recall all tracks. <laughs> Say, you're the tract. The tract is a cold thing. God loves you here. How much many loves me here? Am I stupid or something? You give me a piece of paper and tell me God loves me. You, are you crazy? We don't know how to love. So we are mechanical. We've become just like the far, you see. And we are the sad, you see. What a tragedy. Okay. Let's try and figure out what's wrong. Turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 9. I keep trying to figure out why the Lord does not allow me to leave things. Every time I try to leave things, he doesn't allow me to leave things. Uh, I mean, I got, I got all my notes. See the 15 things there? They're all there. But I can't get to them and you ain't getting them. Because we can't get to them yet because your head ain't right. I can give you a list, but that's, that's <laughs> a list ain't nothing if you got an attitude problem. God's working on your attitude. Your cousin is a Muslim, and you don't go to his house anymore. And that's your brother yes. in the pig pen. But you're too clean to mix with pigs now. You know, you, after all, you were never with the pigs, were you? You were born like this. Matthew chapter 9. I can't get away from this verse. It keeps haunting me. It haunted me since November. I've been teaching this verse all year. You ask the folks in our fellowship, man, I'm stuck on this thing. They probably think I'm just a repetitious record or something. God's working on our heads. Listen to this. It says in chapter 9, verse 36, When he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Is that how you feel when you see those people crowded in the street, in the marketplace, shopping in the mall, sitting on the corner? I mean, does, does something go off in you when you see people who don't know the Lord? I mean, I mean what happens to you? Oh, you're, you're too busy for anything to happen to you. You're just 
going on your way to do what you have to do. You, but something happened to Jesus. Why? Because he knew who they were. Their family. That was his family. He saw the multitude. He said, oh. Groaning. Because he saw a family who were what? Without a shepherd, without leadership. They were wandering like sheep. They weren't sheep, but they were like sheep. Like we heard this morning. Blind, poor sight, dumb. His response. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. And helpless they were. We're 37. Then he said to who? His disciples. Now he's talking to the people who is creating the church from. He says, the harvest is plentiful. Write this down. There's nothing wrong with the harvest. Uh, let me just say something that may be corrective here. He did not say the crop is plentiful. There's a difference on a farm between a crop and a harvest. A crop is, is a, <laughs> it's, a crop is unripened meat, food, unripened vegetables, unripened fruit. That's a crop. When, it's, when you use the word harvest, it's ready. It's a big difference. This is 2,000 years ago. The crop is now stink. Let me tell you what this, how powerful this is. He says the harvest is plentiful. In, an, in another place in Luke, he says the harvest is ripe. Now, I ask you a question. How does Jesus know that the crop is now a harvest? How does he know that the crop is ripe? How does he know that? How can he say that? He looks at people and he says they are ripe. 2,000 years ago they were ripe. You know they're rotten now. But how does he know they're ripe? This is going to be good. Listen, he knows they're ripe because he ripened them. I'm going to prove that. I'm going to prove to you that Jesus has already prepared every one of the 5.2 billion people on earth to be born again right now. He has prepared them for born again. Ain't nothing wrong with them. They are looking for God. They want to be saved. Say this with me. The world wants to be saved. I'm going to say this. I feel this. Say it again. The world wants to be saved. They ain't running from God. They're trying to find him, Jesus says. They are ripe. But read the next statement. I have a labor problem. There's nothing wrong with your unsaved uncle. You just can't get him saved. There's nothing wrong with those Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims and Rastafarians. Ain't nothing wrong with them. You just don't know how to get them saved. Ain't nothing, they're ready to get saved. You just can't get to them. I got a labor shortage. Not, this is not referring to numbers. The word Jesus used here is referring to quality or skill. Write that down, please. He says, the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are unskilled. They don't know how to reap the harvest. They are not equipped. They've not been trained to reap the harvest. Well, let's find out what he knows about this harvest. The next verse says, 
the harvest is ripe, plenteous, but the laborers are few. The qualified laborers, write that word down. The qualified laborers. You've got to be qualified before you go harvesting. I'm going to prove it in the next chapter. You don't just go into his harvest. Oh, sorry, I gave it away. Read the next line. Verse 38. Look at me, look at me, look at me. This is deep. He says, look, the harvest is ripe, but don't go there. Thank you. He said, look, I know they're ready, but I don't want you to fool with that harvest. That's why we're dealing with this subject, the workplace. He said, people want to get saved. He said, but I don't want you to touch them. That's amazing. He says, first, go and report to what? The, come on, I can't hear you. The, oh, I want to stop on this word for a while. The Lord, say Lord, Lord. of the harvest. The word Lord, hey, it means owner. Get it in your brain. It's not a spiritual word. It's not some, some super spiritual. You know, weird word. It simply means owner. Man, this thing will blow your mind if you get it. When you rent from somebody, the guy who owns the apartment is called what? The landlord. Why? He owns the land. So he is a lord. The word lord, kurios, simply means owner. When you say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. Don't get super spiritual. It simply means he owns your life. That's why you can't sleep where you feel like, eat what you feel like, drink what you feel like, smoke what you feel like, go where you feel like, have sex where you feel like. Why? Because you ain't own this property no more. That's why Paul says, don't dare say Jesus is your Lord, except it be by the Holy Spirit. Christ says what? Many will say, owner, owner. And I say, I never knew you. If I owned you, how come I didn't run your life? Every time I show up, you lease in my property to Satan. You can't just sleep with who you feel like anymore. Why? This ain't your property. If he is your owner, do you know what salvation is? When you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is owner. He says, ah, I'll save you. If I take over the management of your property, you're saved. So, let's look at the statement then. Go to the owner of the harvest. Let me tell you why that's important. If he owns it, he knows it. No, it's not that he knows that he owns it, but he knows the harvest. Why? It's his. He understands the crop. Glory, hallelujah. So he said, don't touch my farm. Come talk to me first. That's what that verse teaches. I mean, Jesus is so cool. I mean, as simple as the statement is, he was particular in his instructions. He says, look guys, everybody out there want to get saved, but don't go to them. Don't touch them. Don't mess with the harvest. Do you know how many people hate God because of you? If you had just left them alone, they would have been saved.
I mean, some of your family members don't want to see you anymore. Be honest. They hate when you show up. Why? You offend them. You always think you're better than everybody in this house. You, who do you think you are? Since you became a Christian, all of us are dirt. Mess with this house. He said, look, uh, all those people out there are ripe, but don't go to them. Come talk to me first. This is my farm. Why? Because you see, on every farm, you got different types of crop. You got bananas, oranges, mangoes, limes, corn, wheat. Soybeans, tomatoes, and all the farm. The earth is the Lord's. What do you do? What we normally do is we don't consult with God about the crop. We just go headlong into the crop. We wander off into his farms. You know, we're going to help God get them all harvested. We're going to help God out. So we jump in our bulldozer. Headed for the tomato patch. Do you know Jesus? You know you need to get saved. You are a sinner. You, you no good sinner. You better repent. This bulldozer coming into the tomato. God is saying, no, 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 please. No, go back. Go back. Then you bring a tractor to handle the bananas. Right crop, wrong equipment. I see it all the time. See, the tomatoes are the businessmen. <laughs> the onions, that's the nursing profession. The wheat, that's the law enforcement agencies. The mangoes, uh, that's, that's the politicians. Uh, the soybeans, that's teenagers. I mean, all the crops are different. Some of you actually hate teenagers. You ain't ready to reap that crop. And they know you don't like them. And you dare tell them you come in the name of the Lord, the owner. You mean the owner sent you to get me and you killing me like this? You offending me like this? Is this how he thinks about me? I mean, you, now you told me he sent you. Is this how he thinks about me, the way you're treating me? We call it witnessing. God calls it destruction. He says, please don't go to the harvest. Come to me first. Read it. He says, go to the Lord of the harvest and ask him to send. Wow. He said, don't go. Let him send you after you come to him and talk to him about his harvest. Lord have mercy. See this young man here? This young man here is he's equipped to reap a certain type of harvest so when he comes and he maybe he's he may sing in your traditional church with your bulldozer what he's riding is a motorbike and you can't understand the equipment he's using because you got a big tractor so you can't appreciate his music Cause you got a bulldozer life. But that's he, he's, he's equipped for that harvest. You got youth problems, you call this man. Why? Don't touch those young people because you don't like them. Bring in the right equipment. You don't like it where they wear their pants all the way down on the bottom of their hip. 
You don't like when they wear the dreadlocks. So bring a guy in who likes that. Let him read them for you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Bless God. Because if you try to reap it, you're going to tell them, pull your pants up, cut your hair, clean your nose. Messing up the harvest. Have mercy on me, Jesus. He says, you don't touch the harvest. You report to the owner of the farm and let him send out the laborers. See that? Let him send out the laborers. Let him, the owner, send out the laborers. Let him send out the laborers. That means the owner actually holds laborers back. Let's see how this works. Now remember, when you read these books in the Bible, uh, these were not written with chapters, so you got to keep reading. F -f Forget about 10. See that 10 there? Yeah. Look at the 10. That chapter 10? That doesn't exist. Keep, keep reading. Okay. Keep reading. What's the next verse? Read it out loud. Yeah. And when he had called his disciples unto him, he gave them power, gave them power against, unclean against unclean spirits to cast out demons. Man of diseases. What's the next verse? He gives the list of the names. Look at verse 5. Read it. Read it loud. These 12, Jesus sent what? For, hold it there. Watch this. These 12, he sent. For, he sent. Read the next verse. With these instructions, what he had? He had a classroom. He had a lesson. Please get this. He didn't just send them. He had a seminar. Chapter 10 is a seminar on witnessing. You don't just go. You need instructions. Now, you want to hear the instructions? The, the instructions actually begin with a negative. Read it, next verse, next line. Do not go. Okay, hold it, hold it, hold it. Here's, this is confusion. He sent them. But then he says, don't go. Now, wait a minute. Go you into all the world, but don't go. Are you confused, Jesus? No, I'm confused. I'm protecting my harvest. Come. Here's power. But don't go. Wow. Saved. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Power. But don't go. Why? I know my harvest. Read the next statement. Do not go where? Into the Gentile territory. Why? You don't like them. They know you don't like them. You wish they would go to hell. This is crazy. Doesn't Jesus love everybody? Yes. That's why he don't want you to touch them. Doesn't Jesus love the Gentiles? Of course he does. That's why he's telling you don't go near them. Because you're going to mess them up. You're going to misrepresent me because your attitude ain't right. You don't like them, so don't go there. Let me tell you, I found this out. 30 years of walking with Jesus, God protects people from you. He usually has trouble when you get to them. You know, when you bypass his protection mechanism and you get to, the, oh, they're in trouble. He goes, oh, no. She was not supposed to go in there to meet him. Now I got, I got two problems now.
do not go. This is incredible, isn't it? This is amazing, man. This is amazing. He says, you guys only know how to reap what you've been trained for. You grew up Jews. You understand Jews. You understand the culture. You understand the language. You understand the food. You understand the temperament. You understand the attitude. You understand the mentality. So stay with them. Yeah. Only deal with them. You can only reach those who you are trained to reach. So stay with them. Don't go to Gentiles. You don't like them. You misunderstand them. You don't know who they are really. You don't even understand their culture. You don't understand their language. You don't understand their temperament. So don't fool with that part of my farm. There are people you are not supposed to witness to. You take that to the bank. Hmm. He protected the Gentiles. I mean, that's, what, that's what he's doing, isn't it? He's not really saving the Jew. He's protecting the Gentile. <laughs> he said, I don't want you to go to them. Why? I love them too much for you to go to them. Because you are going to destroy my harvest. Boy, Jesus is smart. Now, he tells them where to go, where not to go. He tells them what to say. Look at verse 7. As you go, preach this message. Now, remember we talked about the kingdom? Okay, watch this. He says, this is the message. The kingdom of heaven. He said, that's what they preach. That's, that's, that's the gospel. What are you preaching? All this stuff you're preaching. Calvary. He didn't say, here's the message. Tell them that a savior has come. That's not the message. I know it sounds good. I know we preach it. But that's really not the message of the gospel. He didn't say, tell them that I'm going to die on the cross and shed my blood for them. That's not the message. But we keep preaching. I can't wait for next year, November 2000. We're going to spend a week on one subject, the kingdom of God. When you emerge from that summit, you are going to be so ready for the 21st century. Because you're going to have the gospel clear in your mind. You're going to know what the gospel is. Most pastors never had a course on the kingdom. And you know that's true. You go to Bible school and get a degree. And they never had a class on the kingdom. Eschatology. Hermeneutics. Theology of God. The doctrines of the faith. Tell me about the kingdom. The efficacious blood of Jesus. The quality of healing in the divine manifestation of redemption. All the deep stuff. But tell me about the kingdom. The seven last words of the cross. The size of the thorns in his head. Shut up and tell me about the kingdom. I'm a, I know I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to get in trouble. I won't get in trouble, but you see, I'm telling you, man, I have sat with pastors who've been pastoring for 40 years, and I sit, just ask one simple question. Uh, tell me about the kingdom. What's the kingdom of God? And he cannot tell me. And he trained people for 40 years. The instructions. I don't want you to preach Judaism. I don't want you to preach Kehaphasism. I don't want you to, to preach Gamelialism. I don't want you to preach <laughs> Jesus. Read this. I don't want you to preach the blood. Well, I'm going to get in trouble. He says, you go and preach this message. The kingdom of heaven has arrived. Tell them a new government has returned to earth and citizenship is now available for everybody. That's the message.
Jesus never said go and make Christians. You know, my biggest problem as a pastor is Christians. The church has produced a problem. It's called Christian. What's a Christian? A Christian, here's a Christian definition. A Christian is a person who goes to this place every week for a couple of hours and go through some promotions. That's a Christian. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever cease being a citizen of your country? I mean, you travel all over the world, but no matter where you go, are you always a citizen of your country? And how come you keep changing on Mondays? I'm a Christian on Sunday. I'm this religious person on Sunday. I'm this person on Sunday. But on, on Monday when I go to work in the workplace, everything shuts down. I don't know what to say to people. I don't talk to them about my relationship with God. You know, everywhere I travel, people ask me, uh, where are you from? What's that? That's a citizenship question. How come they don't ask you where you're from? In reference to the kingdom of God. Another question would be, why are you different? Oh, because I'm from a different place. Really? Where? My citizenship is in heaven. Is that in the Bible? Is that in the Bible? Oh, really? So I thought you was from Brazil. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have dual citizenship. Really? Yeah. So you live in Brazil, right? You also have another country, yeah. So where's the constitution? Right here. That's it. That's it. Yes. Preach this message. The kingdom of heaven has arrived. Look at verse 16. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. I want to close on some of these thoughts that he's given. What is chapter 10? It's a seminar on witnessing. And it starts out by restricting your witness. That's incredible. Don't witness to everybody. That's what he says. <laughs> the church has been teaching us the opposite. You got to really study Jesus, man. He is something else. Uh, what do you do? What is your career? Huh? Accountant, okay. Now, let me try and make this practical. Miriam is an accountant. So Jesus comes to Miriam and says, Miriam, uh, the harvest is plentiful. Everybody in this country wants to get saved. So I'm going to send you out into my harvest. But do not go to the lawyers, the doctors, the nurses, the youth. Go only to the accountants with this message that the kingdom of heaven has arrived in their workplace. 
Now, this is, this, is, this is wonderful. This is wonderful. Because now, the pressure is off her to try and act like she knows about politics or act like she knows about technical stuff. Or act. God said, enjoy your career. Why? You know accountant language. You know accountant culture. You know the accountant mind. You know the accountant temperament. You can use accounting examples to express the kingdom of God in the language they can understand and they are impressed because you are good at what you do and therefore they know that if it's good for you, it's good for them too. Pressure's off. This principle follows through the entire New Testament. It follows through. Peter was a small town, hick town, village boy. Paul was a big city, <laughs> merchant, family, rich, famous daddy in business. In a metropolitan city built by the Romans where there were hundreds of cultures every day because it was a center of merchandising. Peter was born far up north in a little town where they only married one another. What's the difference? <laughs> Jesus said, Peter, you're going to be the pastor of the church. But you only can pass the church, pass the church in Jerusalem. Read your Bible. This is important. He says, "You stay in Jerusalem. You stay in Jerusalem. Why? You don't like Gentiles." Peter was a prejudiced, narrow-minded, anti-Gentile brain. He hated these people. Oh, you all don't understand me. Let me show you some. Stand up there for me, Joe. Stand right here. Okay. Joe. Uh, stand over here. I want to show you how serious God is about the harvest. This is Peter. Over there, far away on coast by the Mediterranean Ocean, is a guy who's ripe. His name is Cornelius. He is a Gentile. Over there is Peter, a Jew who hates Gentiles. And God, at the moment, only got a church full of Jews. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Bartholomew, Thaddeus. These guys are all Jews. They hate those people. But this guy starts to pray. Oh, God's in trouble now because the fella is saying, I want to get saved. I want to get saved now. God says, no, not yet because I ain't got nobody ready for you yet because they don't like you. I want to get saved now. And he's crying in this house all on the coast saying, I want to know about Jesus now. I want to be born again now. I want to come to the kingdom. And God said, oh, I'm in trouble. Let's see. God's in heaven said, he looks at Peter, he looks at Cornelius, oh dear, oh man, I need somebody who loves Gentiles. Oh, stand up for me. Stand over there in the aisle. God say, oh Lord, that Paul is the one I really want because he like, you know, he open, he, he, he understand these people for this fella. But you see, he ain't saved yet, so I got to do something with this fella. Let's see what I can do. Maybe for just a couple of days, I'll try to change his mind. So I'm going to put him to sleep, give him a couple of dreams, and talk to him. Yes, yes. yes. Oh. yes. Why? Because I don't want him to mess up the house. I 
I want to show you how deep God is. God says, well, that fella, now he's supposed to come to God. But he's taking too long. So God convinces this guy briefly, just for a short period, because he still was prejudiced. And he shows him this dream. You know the dream. He showed these unclean animals and everything. And God says, now here's what I want you to understand. I'm getting ready to send you somewhere, but when you see the unclean animal, don't call it unclean. At least for a couple of hours, just get him saved for me. Are you understanding this, Pastor? There are people who run when you show up. And God made them run. You say, oh, they're afraid of God. They ain't afraid of God. They're afraid of you. Matter of fact, God's afraid of what you will do. On Sunday morning, I'm going to give you the 15 things. So you got to stay over. God says, Peter, let me convince you, man. The guy's okay, okay? Now, before you go, let me tell you, he's okay. Now, before you go, I know when you go there, you know, you have spasms, you have some brain problems, you have psychological problems, you know, you, 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 you know, but that's my son. I know he's a Roman, <laughs> he's a Roman centurion, but that's my boy. He ain't dressed right, he ain't got the right attitude, he ain't got the right religion, but that's my son. Now, you know, I know you don't like him, but I like him for a couple of hours, okay? So, Peter goes, and he goes to the guy. And, and man, Peter has problems, you know. Uh -huh. Guess what the Bible says? Peter goes reluctantly and begins to tell the guy about Jesus. Why? The harvest is right. But guess what? Peter, listen, 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 this is deep. Peter preaching to the guy and hope he doesn't get filled with the Spirit. Read your Bible. Because when the Holy Spirit fills the guy, Peter's shocked. What you doing speaking in now? You, you, <laughs> you're the Gentile. You can't see. Go ahead, clap your hand. You got the point, right? He didn't expect that man to be saved. And that's how you feel about the Muslims, don't you? And the Hindus in your country. And the Spiritists and the white people and the black people in your neighborhood and the Indians you, you, you just can't believe they could join your church even when you witness to them you don't believe they're going to get saved you only do it to, 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 to do your duty God says, Peter, you know, I just needed someone to tell him about me. That's enough. I'll do the rest of it. He believes I fill him with the Holy Spirit. And it says, Peter. ministry just for a couple days because after that he ran read your Bible he ran back to the Jewish community and says I was never with them 
Come on, read your Bible. I was never with them. I, I, I don't mix with them. He was lying. I mean, the guy is the first pastor of the church and he's lying. Okay, so Cornelius is saved, right? Right. And all of his house, right? Right. So now these people who get saved at Cornelius' house, guess what they do? They go running off home telling people about Jesus. The people they told in the other towns begin to look for Peter. Peter tell them, I ain't coming. So now, follow the Bible now. God says, oh my Lord. Ah, who? Paul. Now Paul, I know you'll get saved eventually, but I can't wait. Bah! Come on, clap your hands. <laughs> Paul, Paul, I'm going to speed up your salvation because you understand Gentiles. You're going to get saved if you don't want to get saved. Come on, struggle with me. Come on here. You're going to get saved. Yes, you're going to get saved. I need you now. I can't use that one. Come on. Come on, son. Will you please get saved? Pop. Knock him out. <laughs> That's God. You get it, eh? And Paul says, who are you? He says, I am Jesus, and it's time to report for duty. Why? I can't wait anymore because my harvest is crying out for you. There are people who you ain't fit to witness to.
So stay in your workplace. And the more you expand in your cultural exposure, then the more God allows those people to come into your influence. And because the world is shrinking and cultures are intermingling, then the 21st century Christian must become an international, intercultural Christian. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. Have a good morning. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.